So the second lecture uh, is titled Critique of Currently Available Guided Implant Surgery System Efficacy, Practicality, and Limitation. Uh, please come forward, Dr. Sill, Park. Uh, let's give him a round of applause. Good morning. Can you hear me well? So they are setting up the computer first. Let me start in a couple of seconds. Right. So hopefully you have a wonderful night. And then also please get ready for the great tonight's gala show. So I want to meet you all over there. OK, I was so excited because I have a chance to meet all of you around the world. And also, I'd like to have a chance to learn about the new product and the breakthrough about the guided implant surgery areas. Dr. Smiler gave a great lecture and about the importance and the need of those guided surgery. And uh, I need to tell about the problem of those guided surgery. <laughs> So let me share my humble experience with you guys. So I've been teaching the prosthodontics about 15 years in UCLA, and then I've been involving many companies, guide system development and testing for the last seven years. And now I'm working with the new biotech as uh, the research and development consultant. So there's uh, so many guide system in the market, right? This is parallel guide kit and then Straman and then full guide kit, another full guide kit, and then metallic sleeve guide kit, and then partial guide kit, and then full edentulous full guide kit. And also now we have uh, those um, uh, dynamic guide kit, and also we have a milling guide kit, and we have a new bio navy guide kit. Right? Those are wonderful systems. Right? So the question is, it's been more than 10 years since those CAD CAM guide surgery system is introduced in our practice. My question is, where are we right now? Can we trust? How much I trust? That is my question. <coughs> to discuss about it, let's go over very briefly about those, the workflow of the digital dentistry. We need the input, like digital. So usually three-dimensional information, one is a CBCT. We, that's going to produce a DICOM. Second is oral scanner or facial scanner that's going to give us the STL file. With those two information, we're going to process in so-called CAD, computer assist design. So we do the virtual surgery and virtual restoration. Well, usually the aptech do the two. Sometimes we do the smile, virtual smile design too. And output, with this CAM, computer assist manufacturing system, we can do the, make the guide through the 3D printing, or the milling through the milling, we can have a guide and process too. Those are overall procedures. So today I'm gonna go over the literature review very quickly about the accuracy of those guide system, and then we're gonna discuss about the workflow of the CAD CAM guide system and the possible error in each steps. And also I'm going to tell you about why we have to do it yourself as a dentist. I want you to plan, I want you to make the guide yourself, if it's a simple case. So 2019, actually, January of this year, my friend published this paper, and then I really like it, so I want to share with you. So they measure, they, me they discussed about the method of the measuring the accuracy of the dental implant position with a digital guided system. So as you, as you can see over here, we can measure the linear district uh, deviation over here, and then apex linear deviation, and also we can measure the vertical deviation too. But what really important to us, based on my humble experience, is this. So this is what we want for the, this is what we planned, this is what actually placed, and so deviation, angular deviation between those two implants is what really matters. For example, this is my case. Let's look at this implant, and then this is what I wanted. However, with my free hand, I really worked really hard, but it ended up like that, so it went up a nine degree. How about the other one? Oh my God, who put the implant, right? It's me, <laughs> I did that with my free hand. In this case, angular deviation is 19 degree, and entry point is about one millimeter, 1.5 millimeter over here, you can see that, right? 
So those the angular deviation is what really make me smile, and also actually this is what make me cry too. So angular deviation is really important. So based on this article, to measure the accuracy of the guide system, we have to look at first we have to do the position assessment. So when when those implant is placed, we have to do the actual place implant with a position assessment. Once that is done, then we're going to superimpose planned and placed implant position. Based on that, the superimposition, then we're going to measure the deviation between those planned and placed. So for example, over here, you can see that the implant actually placed. That is the white material over there. And this is what we planned. So this is a direct comparison, so we can see that in this case, the angular deviation about 4.3, and we have a vertical and a linear deviation. The other way is, as you can see in the left, we can do the actual imp take the impression and make the cast. Well, we can do the intraoral scanner, and then using the scan body, while well, there's a structure over there, then we can simply merge, and then we're going to compare those two before and afters. That is many different ways. However, what really bothers me is this. To measure the accuracy of your guide system, the accuracy of measuring of guiding system also depends on those stuff. What well, is the geometric accuracy of the CVCT, and also quality of the CVCT, geometric accuracy of the intraoral scanner, and accuracy of the superimposition. So for example, here we have a two-dimensional image, and I do the superimpose over there. And then two-dimensionally, I can see the difference before and after. But even that is also depend on those digital information of quality and accuracy. Let's go over for that, because that is exactly what we face in our guided surgery system, too. 2014, there was one article published, and they went over the 2,359 article, and then they selected 24 the studies. And then what they found is this. In terms of the free hand and the full guided system, and they found the free hand is much worse than the full guided over here. So here, entry point of 1.38 is the free hand, and the full guide is 0.78. So in terms of angulation, if you do the free hand, 5.3, and then if you do the full guided surgery, 2.57. So what they're saying is, hey, guided surgery is definitely better than the free hand. OK, I can get it. How about this? And then they just do the dissect about the full guided system. So in this case, the average is about 0.94 millimeters, and apex is 0.2, 1.29 millimeter, angulation deviation is 3.65. But what they found is, uh, in terms of accuracy, the two supported guide is much better than mucosa two supported. And then mucosa supported is a lot worse than the two supported. And then even we compare with the mucosa supported and the bone supported, usually they are same one, not the pretty much almost close, it depends on the situation. And also they find out that flatness surgery has a better accuracy than the flat raised surgery. So in terms of summary, what they found is overall, their entry point is 1.12 millimeter. And then the maximum error is 4.5 millimeters. Apex, 1.39 average. Maximum is 7.1. Angular average is 3.89. But their maximum range of the error is 21.16 degree. What the hell is going on? You remember the, my bad case? That angulation is a 19 degree over here. But this case, even the guide, then can we create the 21 degree of the error? What is going on over there? Well, based on my humble experience, it is possible. Yeah, average accuracy is important. However, as a clinician, those range of the error is also important to us because that error can happen to my clinic and my patient, even though I'm using the guide system. How about this case? This is another article published in 2014. And then this is a very similar situation. They reviewed the 73 article studies, and then what they found is entry point is 0 0.01, apex 1.2, angulation 23.8. And what they found is the acceptable inaccuracy of guided surgery is 2.0 millimeter. In other words, safety margin is 2.0 millimeters. Right? But really bothers me is this. Still, there's a lot of error. 
6.5 millimeter. I placed the implant and then 6.5 millimeter. Why this, with this number, I'm going to cut the nerve, even though I'm going to do the guide. What is going on? Let's discuss about why we have those errors. Why we have those errors in our clinic, even though all those articles shows that real great accuracy of the guide is surgery. So to do that, let's go over the general workflow of those uh, CAD CAM guide implant surgery. First, we do the CBCT, that is um, for the foundation information in terms of the bone. And we have an intraoral scanning, that is for the above the gum structures, right? If we take the impression, then we put the stone, and they can do the extra the scan, or we can do the scan with the impression directly. Once that is done, we receive those two information, and we merge. So above the gum information is STL. Below the gum information about the bone is for the DICOM from the CBCT. We merge those two information together, then I have a complete blueprint. With that blueprint, we're going to do the planning. Once the planning is done, then we do the producing. So depend on the method, we can do the 3D printing, or we can do the milling. Once those procedures are done, then we have to do post-production cleaning, like the, we have to remove the supporter and clean the inside and also light curing. Once that is done, they deliver to our clinic, and then I'm going to do the implant surgery with the guide. Now, let's look at step by step and then where those errors come from. First, the CBCT. What do you think? Your CBCT is accurate because you spend a lot of money on the CBCT? Well, first question is this. Patient move. When patient take the CBCT based on the 2006 article, average patient move 1.5 millimeters. When they breathe, they move 60 millimeters, right? And also, the, they pointed out that about 21% of patients move while we are taking the CBCT. When patients move, as you can see over here, you can see there's a double line over there, right? This is a good image, this is bad image. Also, when you look at the intra, the occlusal view, you're gonna see those two lines over there. So bottom line is you have two lines, and then how do you know that which one is real images? If you have this, and then you're going to cause a great discrepancy in terms of accuracy of your guide system. And also, we have to remember about the metal artifact. Metal artifact, any metal causes those significant compromised radiographic image due to the beam hardening, motion, edge effects, scatter, and nose. Over here, as you can see, this is the original shape of the metal. But once the X-ray photon hit it, it's going to look as this. So all the image is basically compromised. So for this case, patient came to my office to have an implant on those premolar area, but patient has an existing two implant, and then when those X-ray hit this, and you can see a lot of backscattering happen because of the titanium over there. Problem of those backscattering is when that happened, I cannot tell where is the bone, where is the nerve because all image is gone, right? If we do not pay attention to this, and then we're going to have a compromised CBCT image, and then if we make the guide based on that CBCT, good luck for that. That is a limitation what we have at this point. And also, let me talk about the poor contrast. Contrast means that black is black, white is white. Let's look at this. This is the image of the superimposition merging. So you can see those the CBCT and those yellow line is uh, for the your STL. We scan those model and then we're gonna merge together. When you look at it, it looks just fine. Well, this is good. But when I do the magnify this area, let's look at what happened. Now I'm not quite so sure where my yellow line is supposed to be ended. Okay, let me magnify that area a little bit more. Uh huh. Now, my, maybe my yellow line is too inside. Maybe I have to move my yellow line. Let me magnify that area more. Then this is end. So now, as you can see, that there's a lot of gray areas. If your CBCT has a problem in terms of the contrast, then you don't know where your tooth ended, but you don't know where your nerve ended that. So it is very important to have a proper the image of CBCT in terms of contrast. If there was a poor contrast, it's going to cause a blurry outline, and then it ended up the inaccurate merging. 
So we discussed about uh, the problem with the CBCT, possible problems, right? And how about the intraoral scan? I-500, right? It's really great machine, I'm using it. But to be honest with you, in terms of the accuracy-wise, general consensus is this. If we're doing the straight line area, linear area, they're going to be quite accurate. It's over here. This is a conventional impression. This one is for the intraoral scanning impression. However, when we have a curvilinear situation, when we make the coverage on the canine, another canine, then the error happens. So that means it has about 135 micrometers. So prosthetically, I cannot use that one for the full mouse case, for example. So intraoral scanner itself has uh, some limitation in terms of accuracy. Right? And also, this is a very interesting article that they're using the same intraoral scanner, but first one is they do the in scan intraorally, and then also the other one is they take the impression of the same patient and they scan the case with that intraoral motion too. And then it ended up that if do the intraoral scanning, it has a more error. And then they claim that because of the saliva and then anatomical structure and the light problem caused the error too. So my point is, things that we believe that is accurate, maybe it's not really accurate. And then we made a perfect plan based on the not inaccurate information. We need to know about that. Now, let's go over this one more time. So now we discuss about the CBCT and intro scanning. Then how about the merging over here? Do we have a problem with the merging? Well, let's look at this. This is, I'm about the merging over here. So here, this is a white one is a CBCT image, and this is a STL model scanned image. When I look at it, from the very beginning, I found something is not really right. My central insert doesn't look the same. But anyway, I just moved on. Then when I merged together, then as you can see over here, in the occlusal view, there's a lot of discrepancy. Those two images doesn't match. I took the same people with the same pictures with a different motion, but it doesn't match at all, right, over here. Right? So in terms of tooth number 11, they are matching OK. But when I go to the tooth number 7, it doesn't match. So one of those images is distorted. I don't know which one is which. I was so, so annoyed. So then I called the patient, take the impression again, take the CBCT again, because I don't know which one is wrong. So I took the another CBCT impression now, as you can see over here, they are quite similar to each other, and then those merging is much better than before. But as you can see over here, one image is from the STL for the scanning, actual scanning, the other image is based on the X-ray photon X-ray. So they are different methods to make, take the image. There's always error, the physical error over there. Keep in mind. These cases I'm comparing to the accuracy. This is a CBCT, and also I took the intraoral scanning, and then I have a STL file for this case. When I take this STL file and then I, the scanning, I have a difficulty in those uh, edentulous areas, so I have uh, some worry about that. Then let's take a look at it. So I'm moving those, uh, these two from the molar to the other molar, as you can see over here. The yellow line and the white line is not really matching some point. I have a 0.49 discrepancy when I move a little bit long, along, and then I have another 0.34 discrepancy. So once those discrepancies happen, it's very little. So if you don't pay attention, and if your lab tech didn't pay attention to it, then we just move on without knowing the discrepancy over there. The little discrepancy here and here and here accumulated, and it's going to end up the really big mess. It ended up the digital dentistry. So question is, where do those errors come from? My CBCT is an issue, or my impression is an issue, or my model work is an issue, or my STL file is an issue? I have no idea. So annoying. When you face this, you have to do all over again and eliminate one by one. Welcome to the digital dentistry. That is a real face of the dentistry when you face in your clinic. Now let's look at about the production. What kind of error are we going to face? Well, here let's look at, as you can see, those guide is rocking here and there. Can you see that, right? Why they are rocking? It's supposed to be snugly fit. There should be no rocking. 
main issue is maybe the tolerance. But the thing is this, when we make those guide or prosthesis, we're using the CAD CAM system, right? And then we milled while we do the printing. So in the 3D printer on the monitor, I order the computer to make the one millimeter, one millimeter, one millimeter, those are cubic. However, problem is my 3D printer really make that exact same dimension of the cubic? Not really, there's always error. When you see on the monitor, what actually printed out on the 3D printer and the milling machine is the difference. So good engineer, they need to find out what is the discrepancy and they need to adjust it, right? So to keep in mind. Then let's talk about the guided implant placement. So clinical error that you can make, clinical error that I made, and then make those ridiculous results, even though I'm using the guided system. First, let me talk about the tolerance. Tolerance is a permissible limit in physical dimension. So basically, you have a five millimeter diameter male part and five millimeter diameter female part. To get connected, your male part should be a little bit smaller, while your female part will be a little bit larger. In other words, to connect, I have a little bit gap between those two components. That little gap we call this a tolerance. What we call that is a clearance. For example, over here, you have a small tolerance. Here, you have a larger tolerance. But those tolerance little gap have, should be there between guide and tooth, and then between there, be, guide sleeve and drill, and also guide sleeve and then holder and then drill. So bottom line is, yes, we must have those tolerance. Otherwise, our component doesn't fit together. But the less component means that less deviation, right? And the less error over here, too. So when I started, I dreamed about this. Hey, there's a hole. This is my dream. So I put it, it's going right there. Because about seven years ago when I started, I have no clue what is a tolerance. I'm just a dentist. How do I know that about tolerance? <laughs> right? But actually, what really happened in our clinic is it goes like that because of tolerance. And it goes like this. It ended up those huge angular deviations. So Neobiotech, we improved this for situation and then we did our best and this is our result. We have all the engaging like you can see over here, all the engaging and then we're gonna de we decrease those uh, tolerance as much as possible. So this is what I wanted. But in reality, still there's a little bit tolerance over there. Now we still have those the errors. No matter what system you have, you have those errors, right? So I call this the inevitable tolerance, right, in terms of digital dentistry. Let me share this article with you guys. This is a mechanical calculation, and then what they do is they look at the three different ways. One is a sleeve length, the other one is a clearance, and then the other one is they look at the total length. So they look at how those three factors are affecting the final result of the errors. So this is error over here, this is apex deviation, this is uh, entry point, this is angulation. So this situation is this, everything done perfectly, so perfect, right? Perfect CVCT, perfect impression, everything is really great. Now you're going to put the drill on your guide. But simply because of the mechanical and then the physiological the tolerance, right? Now this, going, this error can be happen. Let's look at this. What they found is, this is really busy the slide, the larger the clearance, they have more errors. The longer the length, it has more error. And then if you have a shorter sleep, you have more errors. And it ended up what they're saying is, maximum error, just simply because of the tolerance, maximum error can be apex 2.8, entry point 1.5, angular error can be 5.9. Vertical is good. So if everything was really great, then manufacturer didn't think about those parts, and then you already have a high possibility of the error up to 5.9 degree of the deviation. We need to understand this aspect. Let's look at this. Without understanding the tolerance, when I put it in, I thought it's gonna go always like that. Okay, that is why I'm using the guide. But in reality, when I touch it, slip inside of it, I push a little bit, go into the deeper area, when I do, the guide move, and then my drill is going to go like that. It happened many times, even though using the guide. 
So this is what I had. I do some bone graft over there. This is what I planned, but it ended up like that. Right? Even though I'm using the guide. I use the guide and place implant is so obvious it's really out of the situation, out of the what I wanted, right? So Neobiotech, we improve this as much as possible. So instead of putting it, we do the bone flattening first. Once the bone flattening is done, we put some the point drill, so we're going to prevent those slippery situations. But still, I want to keep in mind, there's always possibility of those errors because of tolerance. How about this situation? Right after the extraction, sometimes we have a high septum. My friend told me that yeah, using those septa and then place very well, and then you can engage as much as bone as possible. So this is what I dreamed about it. This is I believe what I can do. But even though we are using the guide, sometimes this happens. It goes slip inside of it, and then you're going to have an implant over there. Even you are using the guide, this situation is going to happen if you didn't pay attention to it. If your tolerance of your guide is not that great, your guide is tilt a little bit, a little bit over the tilt, and then it's going to happen that way. It's because of the angulation. So Neobiotech, we find the, the solution. We drilled about those septa, and then once it's flattening it, we can go in, so we can prevent this one. So my point is, no matter what beautiful system we have, but the protocol really matters. How to use your instrument, how to use your system is really matters. right? I want you to understand that portion. How about this anterior case, right? This is when we have a very thin buccal wall, and then I want to place the implant over there. So this is what I dreamed about it. But many times, even though I'm using the guide, it goes like that, right? right? For, the inf the, for the record, I'm not the surgeon. I'm the prosthetist. So this is OK to me. So then, if I didn't pay attention to it, it's going to end it up even like this, and then go like that, and like this. Because when I place it, basically there is no counter force from the buccal area or the force from the palatus. So basically, many times my implant is placed buccally. Situation like this, my patient ended up like that. So I take out the implant with a lot of sorry to my patients, even though I use the guide. Maybe you don't believe me. How possible you have that situation with the guide? You want to bet? You can have this situation with the guide. That angulation. Little angulation ended up really big angulation because of we have a total length and also the tolerance. Now let's talk about the dynamic guide. So it is a quite a big the, the hot issue in these days. So when patient comes in, you make those jig or marker over here, and then take the CBCT. Once you have a CBCT, and then this the tracker going to connect you to the the, the drill, and then this tracker connected to those mark, and then we're going to do the mapping and then the positional calibration. So here, as you can see over here, two camera going to capture those two mark, the optically, and then they going to give me a real time the information where my drill is, right? So let's look at those video clip. This video clip is from their company, right? So basically, as you can see over here, once you move your bar and then drill, you can see exactly where it is, like real time. So they claim that this is a real time GPS. So for your safe surgery, great, I love it. Right? So I paid $25,000, right? And then I begin to use it. But the question is, problem is this. It sounds like different system, but actually all those limitations from the CBCT is the same. Patient move, patient's the contrast is the issue. So basically to have this the great system, you need to have a really great ingredient that is a proper CBCT result. And also this system is heavily dependent on the quality of CBCT and restoration of the jig. That little jig basically is going to superimpose actual patient's face and your CBCT. So your jig is the track, we call this a location tracker, is wrong, that everything is wrong, right? That is not really real time, I'm not quite so sure. And also it has a quite a learning curve, preparation and component assembling, mapping calibration. I have a hard time to train my assistant and I gave up. I just do myself, not easy. And then I do not want them to drop those expensive material, right? So good point is the chair side, because the current 
the guide system, once I order it, usually I have to wait about one week. Well, if I express, then maybe five days. But this one is when patient comes in, I can do right away, within two hours and one hour. However, the problem is, as I told you before, there is no physical guide. It's like when you're driving a car with a GPS, so your GPS told you to turn left, but you didn't turn left. Oh, I have to go there, but I'm going to move forward, right? So this system is exactly like that. So it will not like, give you a physical guidance. It's going to give you that optic guidance, but you're going to steer wrong hole, make a wrong hole, even though you are no, if, even though you are, you are know that you are make the wrong hole, mine, right? And then it has a quite a learning curve, and then training is needed. And also when we do it. Those two cameras need to look at those two trackers so I cannot bend. I cannot look at the patient's oral cavity. I always do this way. And when I do the surgery, I have to look at the monitor. So first, it was very awkward. So there's a clear limitation of those, the dynamic situation at this point, right? So overall, the limitation of the current guide system, static guide, yeah, we know the, no, the accuracy of that, right? About two millimeter plus minus. And the problem is you need a multi-visit, at least two visits, and it takes about three to 10 business days, and then no chair side correction. Once your left sent to your guide, it doesn't fit. You may adjust here a little bit, but most of the time it doesn't fit. So basically we have a very, very limited correction, the chance for those guides. And also planning, if there's planning done by the third party, usually lab did it, then what's the point of the virtual surgery? When you do the virtual surgery, virtual restoration yourself, then you know that patient very well by inch by inch. So do not give up, right? That is a, the way I look at it is do the virtual surgery by the dentist, by yourself, is a really great advantage that we can earn from those guide systems, right? How about the dy dynamic, as I told you before, in terms of accuracy? It really depends on the training the level of the doctors, right? So it depends on how you move it, right? And also surgical GPS, as I told you before, there's no physical guide and the learning curve that require the training too. So in terms of the doing yourself, that's what I really wanted to have, right? So if you, I do not want you to do the full mouth rehab for the planning, but if you have only one crown, one implant, why not? Right? So this is very, very oversimplified, my guideline. So in terms of when you do the crown, one implant, and then I want you to look at the first gross dimension of the crown, and then I want you to look at the occlusion plane. And then make the ideal crown that you want on the virtual restoration. Based on that one, you're going to look at those bone, buccal lingual, and the medial distal dimension of the bone. And also you're going to look at the bone around the fixture that you choose. So once you have that one, then you have to balance between prosthetic consideration and surgical consideration, then you need to get a better overall prognosis. Let's look at those quick video clip. Now I'm changing my occlusion plane. So curve of speed change, and now curve of Wilson is changing. So do not pay attention to all those details. What we need to do is just the occlusion plane, and then look at those overall position. That's enough. And then I look at the CT over there, and then when I look at it, then I look a little bit of the bone detail, then I begin to compromise it. But those implant position is why those occlusion plane is important. You want to make your implant perpendicular to your occlusion plane. That is the best in terms of biomechanics. We cannot achieve all every time, but at least we're going to start from that ideal situation, then compromise little by little. Do not start from the surgically first. Well, do not just look at those prosthetics. You have a perfect prosthetic plan, but your implant is on the air or on the nerve. What's the point? So we need to balance those two things, right? So at this point, what I can tell you is based on those three literature review articles, what I can tell you is the full guide is much better than partial guide and much, much better than no guide. Partial edentulous case, then your flimness method is better than flap. If it's a full edentulous case, and then flap is better than flapless, it's confusing, isn't it? 
And then if you have a two support guy, that is better than two say mucosal, then mucosal supported and then bone supported, right? So we have uh, some issue with the mucosal supported. Especially fully identified case, and then please make sure that you need a higher safety margin needed. Over here, I told you that, hey, two millimeters is your safety margin, right? But when you're dealing with the especially maxillary, maxillary full arch situation, or on four, or on six, be aware. Your error going to be up to 8.4 millimeters, standard deviation is about 4.2. So especially when you do the guide based on the mucosa supported, keep in mind you have a huge possibility of those the errors. Okay. And then also, if you do the printing, 3D printing, sleeve is better than sleeveless system. If you do the milling system, then sleeveless is better than sleeve. It's confusing. But now all those technologies are developing little by little, so we're going to get the, good, the result pretty soon. So here's my personal consideration or my recommendation for the improvement for the current uh, available CAD CAM system, right? <coughs> First, I really want to have a chair side guide planning, production, and correction. Once I have that, I want to fix it and I want to put it in patient's mouth. Second thing is, if possible, I would like to have a sleeveless guide with less than 50 micrometers tolerance. I hate tolerance. I know that I need a tolerance, but I hate tolerance. I want to reduce those tolerance as much as possible. Once I reduce those tolerance, then I can reduce a lot of errors. Heat control. I didn't say a lot about this, but when we do the guide, because of irrigation issue, we're going to have a lot of heat damage on the bone. So I want to have a better guide with the heat, better heat control. And also, I want our guide systems promote DIY, do it yourself. Doc, you're going to plan, you do the virtual surgery, you do the virtual the, uh, restoration. So that means we need the user-friendly CAD CAM software. Do not make it so difficult. Let lazy doctors like me you know, make the plan for even for the single implant cases. That's that going to cause the maximize the benefit of the virtual surgery and restorations. Right? And then eventually, my dream or my goal is a static guide with a real-time dynamic guide surgery. So static and dynamic get together. If we do that, then we're going to have a double spatial restoration. So not only one superimpose, we're going to do the two different ways superimpose. If we do that, I believe we can overcome the hurdle of the dentulous case. So basically, we want to reduce the error of the merging of the two images from the CBCT and the STL file for the scanner, while from the CBCT and patient's mouse. Doesn't matter. So those two methods we combine it, I believe we can have a better result. Right. Yeah, that's my last slide. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Park, for your great lecture. Um, it was a great summary on the limitations of um, the current guidance system.